thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to this lecture at this late Friday afternoon. There are exams coming up this month, so it's a hard time, but I'm happy to have an audience. I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to share some thoughts about the new Rijksmuseum. It's still the new Rijksmuseum, though it's at the same time the old Rijksmuseum. Um, I prepared a lecture. It's not so much about art. Of course, there will be enough art for you, but it's mostly about the museum as an institution, and it's about the relationship about the public and the museum, the public and art. I mean, that's what a museum in fact does. It brings two things together, people and art in that museum. And that's the whole role of any museum. And it's also the role of the Rijksmuseum. I have to switch from the, this part to the Apple Macintosh. And I give you a nice picture to look at. Um, and I'd like to bring you back to my first experience in the Rijksmuseum, which was a long time ago when I, was the, uh, when I had the age of 12, 12 years, and I was born indeed in Veendam in the north of Groningen. And I was brought with a bus, with a class of young kids. I was 12 years old, and it took about three hours uh, to bring us to Amsterdam, to the big city, and to a big, majestic museum a huge building. I've never seen a building like that size in my whole life. And I remember entering the building and, and going up the, uh, the, the stairs and the royal staircase and having this gallery of honor. Who of you have been in the Rijksmuseum so far? Okay, very good. <laughs> Who have not? <laughs> okay, still room for growth. Um, very good. Um, so anyway, so for those of you who have been there, you might remember that Gallery of Honor. It's the Hall of Fame of Dutch art and Dutch culture. And at the end of that Gallery of Honor, there is indeed the largest painting of the museum. It's the Night Watch. And it's not only the largest painting, it's also, as our teacher told us, the most important painting in the world. <laughs> and of course, when you're 12, you believe anything a teacher tells you. I'm at this moment a teacher as well, so please uh, take care of what I say. But I, I still remember that because the painting indeed is impressive. You will see that later on. Uh, it's not only the size, it's also the people on the painting. I mean, they are painted by Rembrandt to make some impression. And indeed, it gives an impression to anybody looking at it, and especially for young kids of 12 years old. So that's what I remember. But even more, there's something else that I remember that after we saw that painting, we ran through the galleries with a few boys. You know how it goes in museums with young kids. And we ran and we ran, and suddenly I remember that there was a guard, one of the guards, who was holding us, and I still feel his hand on my shoulder, and this guy was saying, hey ho, don't run like that. This is a museum, so behave. Behave, watch at the paintings, and you have to behave. You have to be silent and watch at them. And if you do so, they watch back. It was indeed a portrait. <coughs> and I, re I don't remember exactly what portrait it was, but it was a life-changing moment. Indeed, that portrait, some 17th century sitter, was looking back at me. And I was even more impressed than that big <laughs> night watch. And it showed that uh, life really can change and, uh, somebody's life, and it opened up my world. And to me, ladies and gentlemen, this illustrates what art can do. Real art has the ability to move people, and art can indeed connect. Because I think that museums are the gateway to time and beauty. Museums, people can connect with art and history. In museums, people can connect with other people and other cultures. And in museums, you can connect with your own imagination and creativity. Key to all these connections is that a museum should be open. That's the key word for today, open. Open as a building, open to welcome the visitor, so open in the attitude, and open in the sense that the collection of the museum should be shared, so it should be open. So the building, the attitude, and the collection. These three things that is what a museum should do nowadays, because I think a museum is much more than bricks and mortar. When I <clears throat> took uh, over the position of general director in July 2008, my questions at that time were, how 
could the Rijksmuseum best deliver its constant purpose for a changing public? What is the role of the Rijksmuseum as the country's national museum? What is the role of that Rijksmuseum in society? And how can the Rijksmuseum make old masters, art and culture relevant for new audiences? I will talk about that and I also will talk about our ambition and I will at the end come back on that and share a few thoughts that I have talking about the results of the Rijksmuseum and the future of the museum, the future of the Rijksmuseum. First, a bit of history. Um, the Rijksmuseum, like some other large national museums dating back to the 19th century, late 18th century even, the Rijksmuseum started in 1795. And this indeed is a very long legacy and heritage that you have to share. But however, it was time for a change in 2008. And to do that, you need a lot of patience and strong leadership at the same time. And above all, you need a clear vision and no fear for change. And I think looking back at the results now in 2016, three years after the uh, reopening, I think we achieved the best results, um, especially where we took the most radical choices. I mentioned a few. The mixed display of the objects, historical objects as well as works of art. Uh, we chose for authenticity, simplicity and a personal approach. And we chose, in a very radical sense, on open, openness. And the Rijksmuseum, uh, it's the national museum, as I said. It's the museum where you can find and experience the story of the Netherlands, however, to a global audience. And we do that in a chronological way, a chronological display showing the best and the most beautiful real objects. No screens in the galleries. It's all what you see is real objects. In fact, this is what we want to do giving every visitor a sense of beauty and awareness of time. So sense of beauty, talking about the art, and awareness of time, that's the historical component. And we do that for children, for scholars, for tourists, almost for everybody. We have about 2.5 million visitors a year, and that's a lot. 50% is Dutch, and there are about 350,000 kids. So that's an enormous amount of visitors, and they all have various backgrounds. However, what we try to do, and to quote uh, Neil McGregor, um, the Rijksmuseum, or the museum, as he says, is everybody's private collection. And I agree with him. I agree with him on many things, but certainly on this one. So the museum is everybody's private collection. In fact, nothing new, and it has always been the general theme for the Rijksmuseum, to present the national collection to a general public. The Rijksmuseum, originated in 1795, started when the private collections of the House of Orange were opened to the general public in a palace in The Hague. Uh, and when the Dutch Republic became part of the French Empire, it was the younger brother of Napoleon, King Napoleon, uh, Louis Napoleon, who's, who made in his palace in Amsterdam at the time uh, a very important uh, phenomenon. He, he made a part of this palace he made it a museum, and this museum indeed was an instant uh, success. As you can see on this little drawing, uh, 1808, uh, and there is, a, there is a, 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 a line written, and it's in Dutch, Uit kunstliefde wordt men hier platgedrongen. And I would translate that as, uh, for the love of art, people get smashed, <laughs> something like that. And what, what you see on this, on this small drawing, this, this small watercolor, is indeed that people coming in and they enjoy the art. It's public, it's free, and um, what nowadays is normal in museums, you see these, these distant uh, barriers to keep a bit distance from, uh, bet between the, 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 the visitors and the, and the artworks, so no damage, don't touch as we all know in museums, but this in fact is the first time that these barriers are used in a museum setting. And it also shows, and that might be interesting for the world we live in today, that a blockbuster, or a so-called blockbuster, is nothing new. It already existed at the early 19th century. So, already in the early days, the Rijksmuseum not only showed old masters, what King Louis Napoleon also did, and that, make, that made the museum very attractive, is 
also to mix that with contemporary masters, Dutch masters, because he wanted to show the world that his kingdom, the Netherlands, was a very active and, and prolific place where artists were still working. And he, wa he was making the combination of, of old masters combined with contemporary masters of the, of the day. The first director of the Rijksmuseum, you see him on the image, is Cornelis Apostol. He was very fond to do so, and he was an artist himself, and in his hands, you can't see it on this image, but you have to believe me, in his hands he has um, the, a little book, and it's the first catalogue of the Louvre that opened in 1793, so only two years before the Rijksmuseum. And this little book, it's thin like this, there's the whole collection of the Louvre in a very little book. And this, this book was his, let me say, the blueprint for the first catalogue of the Rijksmuseum. So what the Louvre did in, after the French Revolution, or in the time of the French Revolution, to, to be open, open for the general public, exactly the same happened in Holland with the Rijksmuseum. Uh, so, so far about the first days, the early start of the Rijksmuseum. Coming to the transformation that took 10 years, the transformation of the Rijksmuseum between 2003 and 2013, so 10 years, um, still the Rijksmuseum wanted to present the national collection to the general public, nothing new, as I said. Uh, and we also want to be, like in the time of Louis Napoleon, we also wanted to be relevant, not only for a Dutch audience, but more and more for a global audience. Um, that's what we do. And in my views, museums, more and more, are becoming a kind of hub, hubs for people, bringing people together, bringing people and art together. Museums can, in my opinion, really do great things for people and society in general. And in order to do this uh, and to create the future for new museums, our keyword indeed is open. Open to society, open to visitors. Open still is the key in everything that the Rijksmuseum does. And as a director, my main task was to not only to finish the work of the, of the building, the renovation work, of course, that was first thing to do. At the same time, we worked hard to open the collection and to, uh, to open the attitude and the behavior and the look and feel of the whole institution. But where to start and how did we start? Um, I, first, I first looked around uh, from 2008 onwards um, to learn from mostly uh, public institutions, not only institutions, public uh, projects, houses, uh, buildings, like airports, libraries, uh, restaurants, uh, and also I, look, I was looking at other museums to, to see what, what do people do when entering these kind of buildings? How do they behave? Some people, uh, sorry, some buildings, building types have a long traditions. Museums go back, public museums go back to, well, uh, late, late 18, early 19th century. So there is already a long tradition entering a museum, you buy a ticket, you, there is a cloakroom, then the, the gallery starts, etc., etc. So this whole cliché idea of a museum still works, however, you, you still have to adapt it to the time you live in. So making this, this round around the world and, and looking at all kinds of places, uh, and especially looking at museums, what were the best practices, I found one of the best practices in Britain, in the UK, where Tate, Tate Modern uh, opened. And I, I tried to analyze what was the secret of, of Tate Modern. Why, how came Tate so good from the start? Um, you have to remember, just before, uh, well, well, Tate opened, Tate Modern opened. The collection is very good. It's not the best collection of modern art in the world, sorry to say, but it's, 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 they made it lively. They made it very, very good. Not only the collection, they made the whole sum of, of ingredients that makes a good museum a super museum. And this is what I saw, a, a building, a great building, an impressive building, looking like a fortress, not very inviting, but somehow it looks inviting. It was intriguing. There was green public space in front of the building, and that was attractive. There was this great hall you come in, and I saw not only that great hall and the architectural, elements, but I noticed there was a very friendly and not intimidating staff. So you come in and you feel welcome, easy. And you saw then, at the end, always a work of art. The, the Oliver Eliasson 
um, piece was one of the gr earliest pieces and that really was a game changer. It, it, it made new people come into the museum and the museum became no less than a, a, uh, yeah, a must-see experience. And people went to see there to experience really something special that can't be seen anywhere else. So, analyzing that, I thought, okay, that might be the secret. And I saw another thing, and that was in the display of the, of the artworks. What did Tate do? They did not use the, let's say, the, the more obvious art historical order of, of isms. So, surrealism, Dadaism, modernism, cubism, etc. No, they completely <coughs> set that aside and they, 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 they were installing the collection on very easy uh, words that everybody can relate to. So, color, or form, or city life, or very daily used words that, again, everybody can relate to, and it works. At least I saw it worked and it attracted a lot of visitors. And there were some other elements in Tate Modern that I took as an example. Um, for instance, how Tate really um, speeded up the whole, the whole city, um, London as a, as a center of the art world, and the whole, the whole area, the whole neighborhood also came to life. All, this all thanks to the museum. And Tate is, of course, a very big place, but the same thing happened on a different scale with the Guggenheim in Bilbao. So, to come to a conclusion, I saw many elements of Tate Modern as a best practice, and now I wanted to use these as a, uh, as a, as a format to use in my Amsterdam reality. And in 2008, my museum looked like that. Um, a monumental neo-Gothic 19th century, typical fortress of elite taste and power, an empty building, in the middle of a desolate construction site, European, European tendering was, didn't succeed. The neighborhood was against everything. It was an empty building, an abandoned construction site. And the, gla the glorious gallery of honor was inhabited by pigeons instead of people. Uh, sorry, state of affairs. The good thing is that the only way was up. And if you see this, and well, you, you almost can't see it, it's a, it's a museum. But if you start to work here, then your first thing that comes in mind, to your mind is open. I have to open this place. I mean, it's, it's, it's most important. So here, indeed, came, I came up with the whole idea of openness. So I started with the building. Um, I was appointed a director at this moment. I walked around. Um, the curators were busy with all kinds of things, but not with the building itself. They were writing books. They were doing all kind of hobby projects, and they should do it because it's, it's good to do that as well. But what was most urgent at that time, this was in 2008, so that means already in 2003 this situation started. It, it has been a situation for, for five years that it was an abandoned construction site and not, not working. And it was, there was no focus, it was quite disastrous. So first that building, because you need a house to, well, to show the art and to have people and to bring these two together. Um, so I thought with Tate and other museums and other best practices in mind, what kind of museum building do we want for the future? Um, we're here in 2008, um, that's only one or two years after the Apple iPhone was started. So it's, it's a long way back. It, it looks still fresh in mind, but it, it's, it's, it's history. It's really, it's, it's far away. So at that time, the, 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 you have to make decisions for the moment of opening, that's 2013. LED lighting, for instance, was at that time still so-so. But I knew that Philips was working on LED lighting, and lighting is essential for, for art, of course. I knew that in 2010, there might be a new generation of LED lighting. So let's wait for that. Are you sure, Wim? Yes, I'm sure. So let's wait for the 2010 generation of LED lighting. So you have all the time make decisions that only will work out in 2013. And the only thing you can do is hope that you made the right decisions. And one of the decisions I also made, or we made it in the team, 
is to make a new kind of museum experience. And main question in that was, where does the museum start? Does it start at the ticket control? Does it start in the galleries? Does it start at the front door? There are many steps in the museum experience, in the museum visit, that, are, that, that could be mentioned uh, as, as the start of the museum visit. And we thought, okay, the museum visit starts in the head of the visitor. Okay, and when is that? Well, that could be an, on the morning when you wake up and you go to the Rijksmuseum, though that's on your program for the day, and if you're a tourist, it should be the highlight of the day, and maybe it's the highlight even of your whole holiday, and maybe it's the highlight of the whole year. It might be the best things that you've ever seen in your whole life. So keep that in mind. It should be the highlights, and it should be the best that you can get at that specific moment. I used to work in the theater world, so when does the theater experience start? Does it start when the curtain goes up, or does it start if you buy your tickets? maybe two or three months in advance? Or does it start if you enter the museum or you dress up and you go? So all these, 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 these stretching this, this experience, uh, we, we played with that. And, and talking in architectural terms, because we're still building or try to build, I found one of the best examples of stretching the architectural experience, not in a museum, but in the St. Peter's Square in Rome. What do we see? We don't see the St. Peter at all. We see a square and Bernini, the Baroque architect, really made a great thing. When going to the St. Peter, who of you have been to the St. Peter? Oh, who not? <laughs> oh, look at that. There's also room for <laughs> growth. Uh, that's good. Anyway, so when in Rome, this is in Rome, when in Rome, entering, uh, going to the St. To St. Peter's uh, Basilica, to the church, you're on the square and you think, I'm in the church. You're not. You're totally not in the, in the, in the, in the church itself. You're on St. Peter's Square, but you are between the colonnade of Bernini. And he gives you, the architect, Bernini gives you really the feeling that you're in the church, in the arms of Jesus, as it's called. So you're in the spell of the building. And that exactly is what we wanted to do in the Rijksmuseum on a different level because our museum is a bit smaller than that building. Anyway, stretching the museum visit, stretching the experience. That is what we wanted to do. And we made it on a different scale, but with the same idea in mind. We have beautiful gardens in the Rijksmuseum. And normally these gardens, they were, um, they were empty, they were green of course, but nobody came there because it was just a garden, a kind of green, nothing. Um, they were there just to, well, to make it nice to look at, but not to experience or not even to go to because your destination is the museum. What we did is that we, we, we stretched the museum experience and we took and we regarded the museum gardens as a kind of outdoor gallery. Sounds very easy, but it's a very clever idea, I think, to widen the whole museum space up to the, up to the gardens. So now, what's happening now is that you entering the museum, uh, you enter it already when you are, let's say, like St. Peter's, that you two or three hundred meters, even before ticketing or even before the front door, you are already in the spell of the Rijksmuseum. And that's what I like, because then the fun starts and the pleasure starts. Your museum experience is already smoothened and, and, and made in the, in, the, in the good atmosphere, really to go to the gallery of honor, going up the stairs and then see the night watch at the end. This whole experience is prolonged for a longer time than in the past. We did some things to make the, the gardens more lively. Um, we made a chess, uh, a chess board just for the fun. I mean, it is, in fact, it has nothing to do with the Rijksmuseum, but for the feeling and for the experience, you are in the museum. And also what we did is to make a new restaurant. Of course, many museums do have restaurants because people want to eat. You need toilets because people have to go to toilets. It's, I mean, these are all necess necessities for a museum. But we made, the muse uh, we made the restaurant a part, a vital part, an essential part of the museum experience. What do we do? It's called Rijks. Um, and what we do is on the, what is on the menu can be regarded as a kind of, of culinary, uh, art historical 
um, it's art on your plate, so to say. So what, we, what do we serve? It's all Dutch related. It is all related to the colonial past. We invite guest curators, guest, guest chefs from South Africa or, or Southeast Asia. Um, and these can be regarded as guest curators. So we have our permanent chef, that's the, that's the permanent collection. He will serve traditional dishes, Dutch, very good, very nice. Uh, and we have now and then people with a colonial, um, how to say, historical link that also is, is making a, 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 a historical flavor to the restaurant. So any, everything on the plate in the restaurant is, is connected with the museum. And of course, the quality, any, any quali anything is the quality of the, of, the, of the night watch because that is the standard <laughs> that we want to bring in everything we do. And I'm happy with Nicholas Lander in the Financial Times the other day who wrote a very favorable review and I'm very proud on that. As you can imagine, we made also a small mark on the international culinary agenda. Okay, coming back to the, to the uh, museum. This, by the way, is the exact same, remember this? Now it looks like that. So it's ready. Um, and what you see here is openness. It's an open atrium. It's before ticketing control. Um, and it's, it's inviting. You come in. There's, there's glass above, there's daylight, and it is open in every sense. And I hope, although that was the idea, not to have an intimidating kind of architecture to make you feel small like that. No, it's open. It's welcome. Everybody, every visitor is a stakeholder, what we say, and everybody should be welcomed and, and not intimidating, but just go to the museum. No work of art to see, that will come later. But first, come in. I mean, for many people, the Rijksmuseum is a first visit museum. It's my first museum for many people. So that element also is very crucial. If you, if you, dis if you, if you destroy that first contact moment, then it's very difficult to attract people in a later stage or on a later age to, well, to welcome them to a museum. So the first museum visit for many people could be a very crucial and important one. Um, we're open 365 days a year. Sounds very easy, but including New Year's Day, Christmas days, national holidays, we're always open. That sounds easy, but it's part of the concept. Just be open. Um, Some things we also did is, and I think that's one of the most radical things that we did um, with opening up our collection. Um, that collection, that really is, of course, crucial. It's the whole fundament of the museum. Without a collection, the Rijksmuseum is nothing. So this whole element of openness to the collection, that we did in three ways. And I will explain these three one by one. First is the new and the contemporary way that we displayed all the objects. So we mixed historical and, and art objects. Secondly, we, connecting, we, we connect old masters with contemporary masters. And thirdly, three, we created what we call Reich Studio, the, the website, and it's more than a website. So these three elements really, really make the word open, the whole phenomen phenomenon open to the max. Uh, first, let me explain and, of course, I start with the display of our objects, because that's why museums um, are there. It's the raison d'etre, and that's exactly why people come to museums. Well, it starts, of course, uh, well, we had this empty museum, so we could start from scratch, and that's, that's a very special. I mean, there's no other national big museum in the 20th century that started from scratch. I mean, we really started from scratch. All the, em all the galleries were empty. I mean, the Louvre, and the British Museum and the National Gallery, I mean, they, they, they had extensions and they had new wings and they had refurbishment in, in galleries or whatever, like anywhere in the, in, in the world. But a complete new refurbishment, a complete transformation of the whole museum on every floor has never, done, has never been done before. So we really could start all over again. Here was an empty building and here was a collection about a million objects. So how do we bring those two together? First thing you have to do, 
of course, is to start to make a selection and kill your darlings. And there are many darlings in the collection of the Rijksmuseum, as you can imagine. So we really have to make a very highly curated selection of these works. We now have 8,500 works on show. In the old days, so before 2003, we had 12,000 works on show. So we decided to show less. It's also a good story. The minister told, asked me uh, just before the opening, so it's larger? No, I said it's not. Oh, but you show more. No, 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 we show less. So why spend 370 million euros? <laughs> <laughs> to make it better. <laughs> so anyway, so we, we, we really have a highly selected uh, series of work. And, and so the selection is key. Secondly, is what I would call uh, connecting the dots. Um, so choosing to, to mix this historical and art works together, connecting these dots. So not more, no, better, only better. And if you leave out one or two, if that makes the gallery or the wall better, do it, please do it. Take only the best of the best, and that's what we do. Uh, and of course, you don't do that as your own. I mean, this museum is not a one-man band. You do that with all the curators. We have about 60 curators, and it took years and years to do so. And of course, we also needed people, uh, colleagues from the educational department, as well with other departments, and we used external advisory boards. And at the end, there we had this final selection. And really, believe me, you have to believe, sorry, you have to, to fight almost to have the selection ready at the end and, and to, to leave out very, very precious, very beautiful pieces. They are in storage or they travel to other places we, or we lend them. However, the selection that is on show is the best for this moment. Um, major museums like the British or the Rijksmuseum, they have been established in the 19th century as national institutions for good taste. Like in Germany, they say, dem waren guten Schönen, uh, gewidmet, institutions dedicated to the real, the good, and the beauty. That's what we do. Of course, this 19th century, typical 19th century attitudes in our times, yeah, we have to, we, we live in different times. So, no longer this authoritative 19th century absolute authority of institutions or banks or, or politicians, accountancy firms, national museums, or even directors of national museums, authority is no longer working. We, the world is flat, as, as Friedman wrote, and you have to deal with that. I mean, that has, has been changed in, in about 10 years, that really big institutions, they, they changed. Museums are places where people encounter art and history, and we all might look at the same pieces. Our demands, demands of many people, they are more and more individual. And it's no longer that one size fits all, but it's one size fits nobody. And I think that museums should no longer have a broadcasting attitude with one single message, but keep in mind that today, a global audience with all kinds of different backgrounds needs more, more narrow casting approach. Uh, and in the Rijksmuseum, Museum, we try, uh, we engage all these new and different audiences with an open mind. And to show you a few galleries, what we did is, is by mixing up all kinds of, of objects, uh, sculpture, paintings, shipping models, historical artifacts. They, were, they used to be in the different departments, painting with paintings, um, applied art with applied art, glass with glass, shipping models with shipping models. What we did is to mix it all together to give you indeed that sense of uh, beauty and awareness of time. So this is what the new Rijksmuseum looks like. It, it, this is the 17th century maritime power, so the Dutch overseas, and everything comes together. Everything is made in the same time. Here's another example, it's uh, 19th century. Uh, and this brings together all kinds of, of artifacts, uh, but together it gives you the sense of the time. And here is the 20th century functionalism modern room with Rietveld, with Yves Saint Laurent, Mondrian, uh, film and some jewelry and, and some abstract painting at the back. So this shows what the Rijksmuseum does at the moment. And here is another painting uh, coming to the, um, to, the, to the connection 
and to the, uh, to the point that we indeed, we invite and we inspire contemporary masters and we invite them, as you see here, Anish Kapoor, to do, even on the Gallery of Honor, an intervention, not an exhibition, but an interve intervention right opposite the late Rembrandt paintings, the Jewish Bride and the Syndics, and it's very close to the Night Watch. So coming in the Gallery of Honor, you walk and you see all these 17th century old masters, and suddenly you get hit by this piece of Anish Kapoor. And really, this has to do, um, and again, you have to believe me if I say so, this has to do with the very sculptural use of paint that Rembrandt is using at his late age. Uh, for instance, in the, in the, uh, in, in, in the garments of, of the Jewish brides, where the paint really is thick like this. And if you see that and go very close and, and s look at it, then you really understand what, what, what Anish Kapoor is doing. Is it sculpture? Is it paint? Is it art? I don't know what it is, but it works and it really gives this whole dimension of old masters and contemporary art at the same time. Old masters is a term that I dislike in a way. I think old masters are really something from a different age. Uh, old masters, I think, are contemporary artists of a different time, but they still work. I mean, Rembrandt or Leonardo or whoever, they still work and they talk to us, so they are indeed contemporary. And the same thing we did in our Asian pavilion, for instance, with the, with the 10th century Shiva, I combined that with the Indian artist uh, Sobhut Gupta. We have IYY in the Chinese galleries, and we have Edmund de Waal with his very delicate uh, ceramics, and that's just uh, juxtaposed and, and next to Arita porcelain, centuries-old porcelain from Japan. So all these combinations, they work. In 2008, my first year, we made a little experiment and we invited Damien Hurst also to respond on our collection. And what Damien did is that he made a, a selection of works that has everything to do with this famous skull. Uh, and it's about vanity, it's about youth, and it's about death. And of course, these themes are international and these themes are universal. And what Hurst did is to make a special selection of our paintings and he combined that in that same exhibition with this diamond skull, and really it made fun. Here's another example. In one of the most remote staircases of the building, a Rococo uh, staircase where nobody came in the past, we invited Studio Drift, a design studio, to make lighting, and it's really moving, and it's making a kind of ballet uh, with light, and now it's one of the best attended galleries in, uh, in the museum. So, Combining old and new, it works. One last example, this is a painting, Jan Asselijn, old master, beautiful. There's a historical uh, incident, so to say. It's a, it's a tsunami. Uh, Holland is below sea level, as you know. And here, the dike breaks and the water floods in and thousands of people were, were, were killed in this, in this 1651 uh, disaster, this, this Dutch tsunami, so to say. And what happened is that we invited uh, a contemporary designer, inventor, artist, uh, Daan Rozegaarde, to make a piece in front of the museum to, with laser, as you can see, uh, to really let people experience what it is to live. Uh, the Rijksmuseum and the museum square is about three meters below sea level. Okay, that's nice information. But what, really, what does it really mean if the dikes uh, break and the water comes in and there is three meters water above your head. So as you can see, the people are really walking beneath the water and then you suddenly you feel, oh my God, three meters water, there's a lot of water. So it, it, it also responds to a actual theme, uh, global warming and, and the rise of sea level that it is a very uh, actual and a, a very big danger for a country like the Netherlands because if we don't invest enough money and uh, repair and invest in the dikes then Holland will be flooded and you will have a situation like this. So that's the end of the Rijksmuseum and that's not what we want. I come to the third element, so the objects, the installation, the combination of old masters contemporary art and the third one I want to have some time to talk about the internet. The internet is really a big game changer. Uh, funny enough, the World Wide Web turned 
only 25 last year. So it seems very young and it seems that it has always been there, but it's not. And we now, however, realize to its full extent that internet is just much more than technology. Open access, again open, open access lies in the heart of the web. And open access, I think, is the way to go, not only for the web. The web is becoming a state of mind and a dream of participation. A state of mind and a dream of participation. And exactly this makes the web the ideal partner for public institutions, art institutions, and also for the Rijksmuseum. And therefore, all our internet activities are gathered in Rijks Studio, a complete new approach to unlock museum collections to a global audience. The web for us not just is a marketing tool, no, Rijks Studio is a major educational project giving new insights and information. Um, we have now already 250,000 works available, 250,000, free to use, still growing with about 30,000 a year. And in June this year, we will launch another project together with Google, and at that time, we will announce the Rijksmuseum to be the largest museum on the web worldwide. The world we live in today is no longer structured as a top-down society only. And also, thanks to the internet, this really is a game changer. Rijk Studio totally fits in this whole idea, if you like it or not. I call it the DIY, the do-it-yourself movement. moment. Uh, sorry, movement. The DIY, the do-it-yourself movement. One little sidestep. Oh, that's not in my presentation. Anyway, I leave the sidestep uh, uh, out. <laughs> So, the, the internet is important. I have to improvise a little. What you see on the web is that, uh, sorry, what you see on the screen is what made us also decide to do so and to give it free and to give it open, no restrictions, no regulations, no copyrights whatsoever. Because already in 2009, 2010, we noticed that if you look for the milkmaid by Vermeer, there are over 10,000 milkmaids available on the web. Not by the Rijksmuseum, but by I don't know who. But they are there. And it's Nightwatch, it's anything. It's Picasso, it's, it's Mondrian. Anything you can think of, almost anything, is available on the web for free. Because that's how it works. Okay. Well, embrace it. Do it. I mean, and if you want that people use the milkmaids and use this image for a car design, a, a Danone yogurt, as they do in France, um, <laughs> a shop interior, t-shirts, ties, whatever. Embrace that idea, and, but give them the best image, because I think it's free publicity. It's just free publicity. So you're aware of people doing it anyway, and it's there for free. So you can't control it anymore. The world is flat. So give them the best and the highest resolution of the milkmaid. And that's what we do. And not only the milkmaid, many things. Oh, here's my image. I, because I'm not only teaching and preaching the internet, I also love very much, just to um, give you an idea that I also love art, I do. And I also love to draw, uh, because we are, in the uh, indeed, we are digital, and we are uh, ahead of, of many other uh, developments, etc., and we are cutting edge, etc., etc., but we also embrace the old drawing. We love drawing. So what you do in the Rijksmuseum, if you come, we share pencils and we give paper and we have open workshops to come in to teach you drawing, because if you teach, nothing can beat that. Uh, sorry, if you can draw, nothing beats that. I mean, it's the best way to really to look and to understand a, an, an image. So, yes, we love the internet, but at the same time, we love the old-fashioned way of looking and drawing and having, uh, yeah, looking, really looking and engaging art. So, to uh, help you think he's not only very digital, no, he's also old-fashioned. I love to be old-fashioned now and then. There's another thing that's happening in museums, as you can see here. I'm happy that the Mona Lisa is the, uh, the masterwork of the Louvre, though the Mona Lisa is like this. Our <laughs> masterwork is much larger. So you can stand indeed with hundred, well, with an audience like this, you can stand in front of the night watch and still have a good view and see what it's all about. So that's good. Still a crowded night watch, and that's more and more and getting more busy and busier than ever. 
Um, still, now and then, you have the opportunity, although not everybody has the opportunity and the chance to see the Nightwatch at your own. Of course, here you really can experience the Nightwatch and really go deep. But the internet gives you even more. Watch the guy in the middle, Frans Banning-Koch, the main character on the painting. This is his right eye. <laughs> and this screen is not even that large, but you have to imagine. I mean, you look at painting, you look at oil, you look at Rembrandt, and the real size of his eye is like this. It's, it's almost life size. But here you can see what the Google Street View technique does if you really, uh, yeah, if, they, if you let these guys work with our paintings, then you can really dig into detail. And it's no wonder that one day one of my most esteemed curators ran into my office and he said, Wim, I saw something completely new on the Vermeer painting I've never seen before. And I said, how can? I mean, it's has always been there since the 17th century. Yeah, but it's ne I, I never saw it, it's incredible. So he saw a, a detail thanks to the internet and thanks to this technique, it really opening up um, paintings, paintings even where we think that already everything has been seen so far. It's not, it really gives you a new insight in works of art because why we do it, I think that technique is getting better and better and better. And whether you like it or not, it's there, so embrace it. The world we live in today is dominated by screens. You have screens all over, and screens and technique, they still get better and better. So this young child is really thinking that the dog is a real dog. It's not, it's a screen. And screens are getting better and they get mobile, so you can bring them anywhere. I mean, everybody of you has a phone, we, call, we still call it a phone, but it's not a phone, it's a complete machine. Your agenda is in it, it's a camera, it's, I mean, your whole life is mo maybe concentrated in that small uh, machine and you can do shopping, you can, your bank account, anything is still, it will be better and it will be more flexible, etc. So this is really going on. And we not only live in times of screens, we also live in times of cameras and sharing this whole thing. Whether you like it or not, people do it. It has to do with ownership. People make a picture and then they think, okay, I've seen it, I've been there, I've, I've, I've taken notice and it's a, it's, it's a bit part of, of, my, of my domain. It's okay. I mean, I let these people go. I just, I, this is another reason that we say, okay, give, all, give the collection for free because these cameras, they get better and better and better. So making pictures, on high resolution, it's all there and everybody can do it. So share it and, and quality is, is getting better, so let's embrace these things. Um, and that's what, exactly what we did. Um, <clears throat> we use our website and it's, it was quite a revolutionary website. It's not a kind of book with a lot of text, no, it's image-based. And image-based because we are a museum and imagery, imagery is what it's all about. Here you see the Ruisdaal painting and also you see the, the, the small marks at the edges, it's language, it's login, it's zoom in, and it has the, 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 the pictos and the language of social media, cut, copy, paste, send, share, so everybody can understand that and everybody can relate to this, to this work of art and, and do with it what, what you want. Here is another example about the high quality, you see a, a still life by Abraham Mignon, a 17th century painter, um, and you really can, can zoom in on that butterfly and if you see the butterfly, the quality of that painting, it's, it's hard to imagine that you look at a 17th century painting and what even is more interesting, that you can use that Rijk Studio, that enormous browser system that is behind, that you can scroll through that collection and, for instance, search for butterflies and then you will find butterflies, or you will find bread, or you will find anything about Amsterdam, or Cambridge, or whatever, or even find a whole Rijk Studio on red. If you put in red, then, but it's a lot, of course, then anything that has to do with the color red will show up in that enormous search engine, and you can choose. And it's not only paintings, no, it's applied arts, it's jewelry, it's painting, it's drawings, and this, this combination, this collection of works, well, that's, that's completely crazy, of course, but it gives you a new insight in the collection, or moustache. I mean, there are many, many <laughs> moustaches in the collection, but if you, if you imagine 
uh, uh, making a history about the moustache. I mean, does, that, I don't know if there is a book about the history of moustache, but if not, this would be the ideal search engine to, to, to have moustaches, and not only from Europe, but also from Java or China or wherever. So this Reich Studio is really opening up the whole collection, and you can play with it. And then the real part goes further, and the fun really starts, because it's all for free. You really can use Reich Studio, you can take it, and if you're a designer and, and well equipped and you have a 3D printer, then you really can make this, this on the, the white one is the original 17th century lace uh, color, but uh, the, the girl is wearing a, a gold one, and that's an adapted one. It's printed on a kind of, of, of plastic, it's very cheap, but you can imagine that this kind of, of decoration is very fun and it's very nice and it is related to old master 17th century, though it's cutting edge uh, 21st century design. Another example uh, that I saw is, uh, I mean, we didn't invent it, we didn't support it, they didn't pay us, no. It's just there, but this is on, on Madison Avenue, so it's fine. Then they also can see some good art in New York. This is the background <laughs> uh, suit supply. Perfect, I was very happy to see this. This also, I'm happy to see this. All kind of masterworks used as prints for, yeah, I'm looking at this screen, sorry, but you look at it. So all kind of screens uh, with masterworks from the Rijksmuseum, I would say collect them all. Um, and another designer who was really much uh, working in a very new way uh, using our collection is Irma Boom, the graphic designer of the Rijksmuseum. This is Geert Gentotsen Jans, a beautiful painting, medieval painting, and she found a kind of, of, of engine in her computer and, and she is uh, attracting, uh, distracting uh, uh, color DNA of paintings. And if you look at this, she's translating it to that. And this is the milkmaid and she, make, she makes it like this. And this is very contemporary. Or this Marel, the, 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 the tulips. If you make it abstract, I mean, in my office, I have wallpaper and it's, I have about 70 paintings. And it's all like, thi it's all like this. And people say, are you, are you crazy? And I like it very much because this really shows how contemporary old masters could be if you translate it well. As I said, we, we give it free. And as you know, in the Dutch, we drink a lot of milk. So I was very happy that the main grocer, grocery store in, in the Netherlands, Albert Heijn, uh, was using. Well, they, they asked us, are you OK with and what do we have to pay? We well, don't have to pay. I mean, we're happy. Use it. Oh. Well, we want to use two or three. No, 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 use more, use more. <laughs> millions and millions of milk bottles, uh, not bottles, milk cartons have been used in Dutch households for, for several months. So it's free publicity. I mean, it's, it's good, it's good. It's, it also shows a kind of ownership. And as long as we have the original, I'm happy that these <laughs> images are still uh, around there. So. I speed up a little bit um, because there's a bit more I want to share. Um, it's about the internet, yes. Free for all, that's what I said, you get that. Um, yes, be op by opening up, that's, that's what I wanted to share. By opening up our collection and by creating this Reich Studio, we really rocked the boat of existing museum codes. And the only thing, however, we wanted to do is to bring art to the people and to bring people to the art. And that's the way we did it, as you can see. Uh, by finding new ways to do so, whether if it's creating a digital tool, a beautiful garden, the goal always remains the same. As a consequence, we did not only open things up, we were also the first to do so. First is also a phenomenon that has to do with the internet. In our rapid changing world, being first is vital, also for museums. You have, however, have to have the guts to do that, because if you do what you did, you get what you got. So, where are we now, uh, and what will the future bring? I have some time left, and I also would like to have some Q&A, some discussion with you if you're into that. Um, when the art newspaper, it's in, in our domain, it's one of the leading podiums to, to, to read every month. When the art newspaper started their annual survey in 1996 about visitors' numbers, a temporary exhibition needed about 3,000 visitors a day to make it in the top 10. Last year, 2015, the top 20 
every museum in the top 20 had more than 6,000 in a day. So there is something changing in the world. However, crowded exhibitions and an increasing number of visitors will have consequences in the near future. I don't have the answers yet, but I just notice that museums are doing very well, but where is the end? Where does it end? I don't know. At the same time, um, it has become apparent that museum audiences seek different forms of participation and engagement. Museums have been very good in what I would say broadcasting so far. But thanks to the internet, uh, relationships have become flatter with room for dialogue and discussion. I think that as public institutions attract new visitors, we must strike a balance between treating them as an audience, like in the old days, uh, but more treating them as a community, as in our days. And this also has to do with ownership. And after all, our collection, everybody's collection, I think coming from the 19th century, the museum, we emerge to our museum and we will move forward to your museum or my museum, so more individual. Therefore, the Rijksmuseum is constantly anticipating, anticipating and open to change because the world we live in today is always in flux and changing before our eyes. What we think is the future today is reality tomorrow. So we also keep on changing all the time in the museum. And one of the things we changed, we didn't do well at, in 2013, but there is a very strong discussion, not only in the Netherlands, uh, to look again at labels, text labels. Some of these labels go back to the 19th century, uh, where curators or the public gave titles to works of art. And some of these titles still talk about Negro or Hottentot or Mohammedan. And these titles, uh, sorry, these titles no longer are fit for the time we live in. So this small painting by uh, Simon Maris, a 19th century, not minor master, but not a great hero, but anyway, he's a good painter. Uh, this, this small, lovely painting was called Young Negro Girl but we changed that into young girl with a fan because that's more what it is and it makes it more uh, correct if you want. Uh, though at the same time, we keep the original title still in the archives. So if you want to look for Negro in the Rijksmuseum, you still can find it if you want, but not in the galleries. Um, we think the new name allows its humanity and lack of Western Eurocentric prejudice to be seen and make it more accessible to more people from more places. And it's a discussion that also hit the press and it was also mentioned by The Guardian and some of my colleagues also in the UK responded on that. Um, so things are changing. Anyway, we come back to the beginning, to the museum and the gardens, um, and to have one more time the word open, because that still is the key word for everything the Rijksmuseum does. Open access to the building, to the collection, and the open attitude, in my view, again, I said it many times now, is the future for the museum, for any museum. I still regularly thank my schoolmaster. Yes, I do that, for taking the effort of bringing this whole class of bouncy children to that majestic museum you see on the screen. It has made a lifelong impact on me, obviously. And my wish for the future, my wish for the Rijksmuseum is that we keep connecting the past, the present and the future with people and cultures through the wonders of the art. You are all, you've been there, not all of you, but you're all invited again to come to the Rijksmuseum. Thank you very much.
run of Heathrow or Gatwick? No, we won't. I went to the National Gallery. Would they do this? Uh, at any airport in the, the British Arsenal? No, we won't. These are closed minds we're talking of. And yours are open minds. Now, have you got any more plans for extending <laughs> the collections to um, other, other places as well as Amsterdam Airport? It's a wonderful initiative. Thank you. Um, now, so, uh, talking about this airport, um, we're getting a new one because airports are also uh, rebuilding and changing all the time, but there will be a new one. We were the first, and so far we are the only real museum that has real works of art, really old masters, on show in an airport, free, and uh, just for people who make a, a tr in transit or whatever. Um, Many colleagues ask us, how did you do it? And I, can, I only can say, well, just, just do it yourself. I mean, at the same time, it's, it's very difficult because airport authorities, it, it's like, it takes a hell of a job to make changes. It has, has to do with security measurements, etc. But it, we did it, so it could be done anywhere. But so far, we're the only one in the world. Um, that's one thing. Um, do we have plans for other? Dependances? No, we don't. Um, we're not going to Abu Dhabi or Dubai or uh, Singapore or whatever. Some of our colleagues do so. Let them do it. I'm, I'm fine. I think if you want to go to the Rijksmuseum, go to Amsterdam. And that's the best thing to do. Sense of time, sense of place, that, that's, that is the Amsterdam Museum. Uh, however, we have this collection of a, of a million objects and we Last year, we uh, lent over a thousand objects to about 121 colleague museums and other institutions worldwide. So we do uh, lend and we show our collection in, in temporary exhibitions or long-term loans or whatever. So that's what we do. And we are, uh, thanks to the internet, we, we are, you, you can reach us, not visit us, but reach us uh, thanks to the internet. But I, I don't do, I don't do uh, Abu Dhabi th stuff. So that's, uh. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, um, okay. um, you've been talking about openness, and I understand exactly the, 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 the principles you're talking about. To be truly open, <coughs> you say that you don't charge for visitors? We charge um, because we need, the, we have 2.5 million uh, visitors and in, in, in ticket revenue it's, it's 21 million euros and I can't miss that on my, on my uh, budget. So if the government, like in, in Britain, I mean it's a complete, new, complete different system here than in Holland, um, but if the government uh, supports me, maybe not with the 21 million, but let's say 15 million, then I, I'm willing to make it free. Would that change your strategic, the way that you... Yeah, would be, would be the ideal scenario, to, to really to give it free, uh, and free means no ticket, uh, no ticket. Yeah. I mean, I very much enjoy going to Trafalgar Square and just sneak into the, to the National Gallery. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. Or, or like the museums on the mall in, in Washington, where you really can can can, sh uh, can yeah can share and enjoy the national collections as a kind of, of, of present to, to the from the nation to the world. I mean that's that's really something. But uh, again, 21 million is a lot of money okay. on a yearly basis. Yeah. It's more philosophical thing because I realise it's a government yeah. issue. Yeah. But I'm just wondering whether it would change your attitude to if you had that freedom. Would it change your attitude to the way? Uh, yeah, but that, that I, I must say that uh, yes, it's it's a good thing to to make it free. At the same time, it's free, so it's 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 worthless. And and so, yeah. at the same time, I, I don't. I mean, it has two <coughs> two sides. I mean, to charge a ticket, then you really are conscious and aware that it's okay. You charge. Yeah. Hey, there are people working. I have a salary. The, the, the things get get to be cleaned, etc. So it, it really you need money to to run a place like a museum. Thanks for that fantastic talk. With Thank you. reference to the image of the girl you renamed Girl with Fun, yeah. I expect from my knowledge of that art from that part of the world that there are very few images of non Caucasians in such art. Therefore, that particular work in its racial reference 
is very significant in that regard. Is it not being overly politically correct to remove reference to race? Why not simply refer to it as black girl with fun? Yeah, good question. Because if the, my, my answer would be and is that if the girl was white, I wouldn't call it white girl with fun. Yes, but that is not, that white is the, the, is the default race in that context. So it doesn't require any reference. But a black person requires a reference because it's a unique image. Some people, someone told me that once she saw a black man for the first time in home, I started crying. Yeah. And when my sister saw a Caucasian for the first time in Nigeria, I started crying. So when the default is present, you don't need to reference it. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I understand what, and I, I, I also agree with what you say. However, I think we are one step further and, and just forget, I mean, black is a color, like white. So we, we, we take it one step further and we, we remove the color. I mean, it's a girl, obviously. So, uh, yeah, that's what it is. But I mean, if, if you want to, uh, I mean, it's up to you. You look at it and for you, it's, it's, a, it's a black girl with a fan. So it's, I'm fine with that as, as well. I mean, that, that's, that's, so write me a letter. <laughs> and, and, and I also agree with that. So it, there's no, I wouldn't say there's no wrong way to, to, to give it a title. But um, yeah, I would say it's a girl with a fan, just like that. And if she had a name, then it was Maria, blah, 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 with a fan. But it's, it's a girl with a fan. When you went to the museum for the first time, you ran through the museum. Yeah. Would you be, how would you be happy with behavior in museums changing? Because one of the things that stops openness in museums, as in classical concerts and other areas, yeah. is a, a sense of a deadening decorum. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, as I said, we have about 350,000 kids. <laughs> and they behave like kids. And they should behave like kids, even to a certain extent in a museum. So a museum is not a mortuarium. Or, I mean, a museum is a, is a place where people engage with art. And I mean, it's uh, coming from the theater. I mean, that's much more livelier because if you go, if you perform, then there is always response from the audience. They like it or not. They give applause. They, they, they say boo or whatever. In a museum, it's not common to respond. I mean, you never get applause or, or boo in a museum. So it's much more individual and, and, and reactions by an audience are much more uh, individual and, and, and much more, um, well, silent. Uh, and at the same time, I, I think to a certain extent, because don't disturb the other visitors, but I think it's okay to, to not to make some noise, but to talk and to 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 share your thoughts and to share your your uh, your emotions, maybe with somebody who are, who you are with. Or, or, or well, I mean, it's not a silent zone, and especially not a sculpture garden outside. I mean, just just have have a bit of fun. Hello. Thank you very much for the lecture, very enjoyable. Um, I volunteer at a National Trust house called Dirham Park near Bath, mm -hmm. which has a lot of original objects in it. Uh, in fact, most of them Dutch from uh, around 1700. And I was wondering, obviously in the case of lots of National Trust houses, they're pre the objects are presented in a particular context. Uh, sometimes the original one that they were designed for and other times collected for. Um, you were talking about how you've um, redisplayed in a museum context, and I wondered if you thought there were lessons that would still be applicable in the context of artworks and so on that are displayed in that different environment, in, in the houses and so on for which they were made. Do you think there are ways, there, there are almost lessons to be drawn from what you've done that could be applied uh, in those other contexts? Yeah, it, it's always a balance and, and a challenge at the same time. I mean, none of the objects that you saw, except for the lightings, none of the objects that has been made for a museum yes. or the Rijksmuseum. So 
all these objects that you saw are made for different purposes, for houses, for, 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 for ceremonial use, or, or whatever. So, in fact, the Rijksmuseum is a kind of zoo for objects, so it's artificial. Um, but like in zoos, um, in the old zoo, you have, you have lions, you have antelope, you have giraffe, you have gnu, you have that. So everything was separated. Um, and nowadays, you see in, in, mod in modern zoos, you see more the savanna or the, the, the stepper. Or, or, I mean, they, they don't mix the lions with the antelopes, but still, <laughs> there is a kind of sense of, 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 of bringing more animals together in a what they call a natural environment, so, woo, so it, it's, it's, more, it's more mixed and it gives you, a, it gives you more s a sense of what a savanna might look like. So, and the same we did in the Rijksmuseum. So if you enter one of that, I mean, all these rooms, they look like period rooms. No, it's not, it's, it's an 1885 neo-Gothic building, uh, um, uh, yeah, evoking the, the time of, of 18 or 19 or 18, 17th century, whatever. So bringing together all these objects, uh, historical objects as well as paintings and, and whatever. So it's almost, it's almost close to a period room like, like you're talking about. And I think the lessons we learned from, from period rooms or churches, where you can still see a original Caravaggio for the place where it is made for, I mean, nothing can beat that. I mean, that's the best thing. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, we are a museum, so uh, yeah, that's, that's a different, different league. I wanted to say, I think color is so important and the background of the walls are so important to works of art. Uh, are you using color? We use a, that's a good question, and indeed you're right, though color is at the same time a very cheap way to change a complete environment fundamentally, and it is changing because time is changing and taste is changing. So. Uh, my pre pre predecessor, Smit Degener, made the neo-Gothic, um, well, the, the, our building looks a bit like the St. Pancras uh, King's Cross uh, train station with all the, all the neo-Gothic Gothic all over painting, sculpture, it's, it's a Gesamtkunstwerk. So, in the early, already in the 20th century, early 20th century, it was painted white, completely, just the whole thing white. Now, in 2013, we accepted for, to a certain extent, the neo-Gothic uh, national uh, bravoure of, of, of decoration. So we brought that back. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of paint and a lot of decoration and a lot of original work. And in the galleries, we used a very dark, very heavy color by Jean-Michel Wilmot, the French uh, interior architect. And it's almost black. And in, in the original, scheme of, the, of, the, of, of, of transforming the Rijksmuseum, he wanted black all over, including the galleries where was daylight, and I said, no, 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 I don't want to have a rock uh, podium by daylight, I mean, it doesn't work. So, he, we have the Gallery of Honor, it's black, and I was a bit frightened, well, I was really frightened, <laughs> because f first coming in without the paintings and the wall, I mean, people in museums know uh, what it looks, if all the walls are painted in a new color, first you, mm, you say, mm, that's, that's kind of radical. But now with the paintings on the wall, it works beautiful. I mean, 17th century paintings are dark by themselves. So to make them a bit look lighter, you need a, a, a dark background. In the old days, well, let's say in the 70s and the 80s, the, the walls were white. And every time I now come and see in a museum, and I see old masters on a white wall. I, I don't like that. I mean, it's, that's something from the past. And I... I they look smaller and they look ugh. So now I like dark colors, uh, especially this black, this Noir de Vigne, it's French. Um, and it is very, very strong and very atmospheric. So, but I, I, I'm sure that within 10 years, it, it might look completely different again. Yeah. Sometimes it looks wonderful, some, some paintings, uh, and, and yeah, some, for some paintings it's very good, 
but at the same time, something these wall colors are competing with the painting, and then, then it goes wrong. So if you decide to have one gallery, one color, fine. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, it's, it's limiting your, your, uh, the choice of your collection. Uh, you can do it, of course, but some paintings, they really they, they, they flourish, they really come alive, and some, pa some paintings, they get killed by the color of the wall. Yeah. Thank you. you. You said you very carefully selected the best works to display after yeah. your refurbishment. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether you do or plan to rotate the items on display, given yeah. you have so many works in your collection. We do. And if so, what criteria might you use? Um, the criteria is, is um, that we always change our minds constantly, and that has to do with um, with our experiences. I mean, we no longer live in 2013. We now live in 2016. So, yes, in between there have been other museums opening up, and there, uh, and we, uh, I saw many works of art between 2013 and 2016. So my experience is different than then. And yes, we do acquisitions. So that means that new works uh, are always welcome to well, to, to, to enrich the, the galleries. So, um, yeah, we change also to attract people to, to, well, some things they are always at the same place. I mean, the Night Watch is the only painting in the whole, in the whole history of the Rijksmuseum that only once changed from position. I, I, I took the Night Watch a little bit two centimeters lower than in the past. Because I, li I like low hanging because then it gets gets more contact, it, it gives you more 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 uh, more contact with the painting. So I hang it a little lower, but on that on that place, Be yeah, the night watch is there. I mean, the whole building is made around the night watch, but indeed we change all the time in the galleries. But 85, 90 percent is is permanent. Is uh, no. well, we have. Um, first of all, thank you for initiating the Rijk Studio because uh, thanks to that I can basically do most of my research for my own living room in my pajamas if I want to. Yes. <laughs> um, second, I was just wondering if you have, in this enormous collection, if you have your own favorite piece of art or maybe wing, and if so, if you go there after closing time to just visit it all by yourself. Uh, I just said I am always changing, so I do not have one. Um, I have many, many favorite places to go and, and many favorite works of art that I, I, I have a relationship with. It's what I call a good morning painting. You come in and they, they say good morning to you, even if, after I've seen them on a weekly basis. So they give back more and more. That's, that's a strange phenomenon. I mean, I, I, I'm very familiar with the collection, of course. I'm very, very familiar with some works. Um, and still, some works do give you every day a new uh, thing. And that, that's very strange to, I mean, it's, it's always there. The painting don't change, I change. I got older. Yeah, you, you've seen other things, it, it's winter or it's summer, you're happy or you're, you feel miserable, whatever. So you change all the time and, and a good piece of art is always, uh, well, it's dead material, of course, but it, it's, it looks as if it's responding and, and that's, that, gives, that gives a permanent uh, interaction between the work of art and, and, and yourself and that makes my job so interesting that I, 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 I'm, I never get bored in, 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 well, in a museum and especially not in the Rijksmuseum. But, um, and now to come to, your, to, the, to the question. <laughs> um, well, I like the Mondrian dress. I like, um, I like, I don't like the Nightwatch that much. I like the, <laughs> I like the Syndics very much. I like some. I like one of the Buddhas in the uh, one of the Guanyins in the Asian department. Uh, whew, I like several drawings, but they're not permanent on show because it's work on paper and you have 50 lux, etc. So works on paper I like very much. Um, I like the, the the lights go up and down, the the, the whole the, the whole ballet of the the studio drift uh, thing. 
um, I like to watch the audience, the, the, the visitors, uh, especially groups of children. That's very fun to look at. Um, ah. Well, I think um, we've only got a million objects to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the good thing is nobody ever seen them all. No, exactly. not, not even my curator. So that, that's, you, you, you can always do new, new, new... Uh, uh, you can always find new works in that collection. That also makes it incredibly interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.